Thank you, Lord. Oh, what a wonderful Savior we have who saves us with not our works, but only by his work on the cross that he brings salvation to us. You know, we move around and touch people and meet with people. We've got to make this prayer with them because it's important that one commits his life to the Lord uh, in whatever stage he is in, whatever situation that he is going through, he must receive Jesus, Lord of his life. You know, one of the things that Jesus said, <clears throat> we can lay hands on the sick and get them recovered, but then if they don't uh, repent and turn around and follow Jesus, I mean, we cast out one demon out of the person and seven other demons, they come back to him because his heart is not filled with the Lord. His heart is empty. So Jesus said, this is what is gonna to happen to this generation who think, well, I can get myself healed, I can get myself uh, 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 free, but then if you don't fill your heart up, those very demons, they come back and uh, when they see that your house is cleansed and purified, let me just take you to that scripture and show you that. You know, but the Howard, he told me once, he said, we don't do much of a favor by going around and healing the people only. It's good to do that, but then we don't, if we don't preach to them salvation and get them born into the family of God, they are going to be in a worse shape than they were in. In Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 43, it says, when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. When an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, how does an unclean spirit go out of a man? It doesn't just simply go out. Evil spirits don't want to leave people. Only when deliverance is ministered to the person and the demons are cast out or, or a demon is cast out, that demon flees and goes into dry places seeking rest. And when he finds none, verse number 44 says, then he says, then he said, I will return. The demon spirit is talking to himself and say, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I will return into my house from whence I came out. So the demon spirit says, okay, let me go back to my same house. I'm used to this house. I can go back into the same place. Uh, he cast me out. He was, he encountered, uh, he, uh, um, he met with a Christian and then that Christian was able to minister to him and cast me out, but I'm going back. I'm going back. And when he said, I'll return back to my house whence I came out, and when he cometh, he findeth it empty, right? No Nothing, no change has taken place in his life. He has not repented. He's empty, swept, cleaned up. He's okay now. He feels a little fresh now since the demon is gone out because that's an unclean spirit. Now he dresses well. Now he's cleaned up. Now he's a little more smart looking in the outside. Garnished and decorated. Probably now he feels he's all right. He's, he says, ah, oh, a demon has gone out of me. I'm feeling so free, I dress myself well, I do something better now. Then he goeth, now the demon, he goes, now this is what the Lord is revealing to us, okay? This is what the Lord himself, he knows what exactly what demons do, right? So when he goeth, he taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than him. So he goes, he goes and uh, fixes himself up with seven other demons. He goes and makes himself and more wicked spirits than him. He goeth and taketh with him seven other spirits, wicked than him, self, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. We didn't do him a favor by casting out a demon. We haven't done him a favor. We have made him seven times worse. That's why some people, they come to church, they get themselves healed, and they say, okay, I don't want to commit myself. I don't want 
to go further. I, f- I feel fresh. I feel free now. I'm going back to my old way of living. I'm going back to doing my old things. Probably demons would have got into you because of some of the ways that that, that person has been living. But then, if you only think that you're cleaned up, you're decorated, and you're empty, I'm okay now, but that's not good enough. You've got to receive Jesus, Lord of your life. You've got to have the King of kings and the Lord of lords come into your life. And when Jesus comes into your life, he comes with the kingdom. Righteousness comes into you. Joy comes into you. The Holy Spirit comes into you. The Father comes into you. And, and you are full of all what God has for you. And when the demons come and see a person who is full, and he is no longer empty, he is occupied now, he is so taken up with this Jesus, so to say, he means, Jesus means everything to him, and his life is now centered around Jesus. Now he is choosing his friends He's not the kind of person who, who used to be. He's different now. He doesn't go along with everybody. He makes up his mind to do the right thing. And uh, those demons can never come back to him. That evil spirit can never possess you. He can afflict you. He can afflict you in your soulish realm. In your body, but he cannot enter into your spirit. You can never be demon-possessed. A Christian can never be demon-possessed. Let's put that wording rightly. You can be demonized, but you can never be demon-possessed. It's impossible for you to be demon-possessed. Demons have no right from the day Jesus came into your life. Your life is sealed. Your, Your life becomes one with him. The spirit that was dead in you is now alive and you're made one with Christ now. The Holy Spirit came into your life and your spirit has become one with him. And the, day that you, and the day that you move out of this body, the Holy Spirit goes out of you and you're dead. So, so we don't do a favor by just getting their prayers answered or probably getting a, getting a demon out of their life. But we need to Let them have Jesus into their life. Let Jesus come into their life and make their lives a different place to live. Their their world becomes a different. There's a world of a difference in that person's life where he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 says, in the book of Galatians 2.20, it says like this, I'm crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, put that scripture. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. So my life is crucified. If your life is crucified, then you get water baptized and your old nature is buried. Right? That's important. Baptism is important. It's not just joining a church or joining a group of people. I don't care. I have baptized so many people. Some of them are not here. When, I, when we used to baptize, we baptized them in a tub in a house. When they were ready, we just buried them. When a person comes to Jesus, he dies. He's crucified. His life is dead. So the first thing you do with a dead person is to bury the person. You don't keep a dead body. It stinks. You bury the person. So when you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you bury that person, that person comes out a completely a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Right? So it has to do with your believing in your heart. It's not just getting into the a dry sinner, getting into the waters and coming out as a wet sinner. That's not how it is. You've got to believe and change. So... We, we, do a, we, we do the right thing in a person's life where he comes into the understanding Jesus Lord of his life and the first thing that we should do is to baptize them. I have baptized hundreds of them even in our homes. And I don't even see, I see them, some of them, they're, they're in churches in different places. But uh, that doesn't matter to me as long as they, are, they have been united to the body of Christ. That's the most important thing that matters to me. 
as long as they are united to the body of Christ, they have come into the body of Christ and to the fellowship. Uh, it doesn't mean that they have to be here, but then they can fellowship wherever they want to. But the most important thing is for you to get baptized. That's the first thing. So you get crucified. It's no longer you live. There comes a place where you say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. And the word Christ means it's anointing. The, there's a, the, the newness of living. You don't think like the old person. You don't do the way that you were doing things in the past. The, the, the word repentance is a very strong word and it, it's turning your life around. You don't think like the old person. You don't, you don't do things like the old way you did. You don't make your decisions on your own. You don't make your decisions by what you see in the natural. You don't, you, don't, you don't do things just because you feel right about it. The Bible says the way of a man seems to be right to himself, but the end thereof is a way of destruction. I think it's right. I think it's all right for me to do what I'm doing. I think everybody is doing the same way. I do it the way that they do. I mean, I'm accepted. So that's not the way we do things. We do things differently because, because when a man's ways please the Lord, that's when you're walking with the Lord, he will always make, make sure that your enemies are going to be at peace with you. You're going to see a difference in your life. So, so when I do things, I, I, I do things differently. It doesn't mean that I do everything right in my life because I know if Christ is not the center of my life, my decisions are going to be different. Go with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 16 and verse number 25. Proverbs 16 and 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. I like to always back anything I say with scripture because it, it, it helps us. Because you can, you can forget what I say, but you will never forget what the scriptures say. Because his word is going to penetrate through deep down into your spirit. And his word will never return unto him void. But it shall accomplish the purpose for which it is sent forth. You're not here by accident. You're not just here just to be doing something religious. You are here with a purpose to hear what the Spirit says, right? There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end of the way thereof is ways of death. It's a way of destruction. It doesn't help you at all. It doesn't help anybody else at all. It's a way of destruction. So I might think it's all right for me, I might think I'm doing the right thing, but that is not the right thing. So put yourself in a position where you will say, I'm going to be a blessing to people. When I meet with people, I'm going to talk about the love of Jesus, and I'm also going to lead them to Christ. I'm going to lead them. I'm going to take the most important step. I'm not going to leave them where they are. I'm going to sit with them and, and pray the prayer of faith, just like the way she prayed just now. And, and it was a prayer that we prayed for those who have never accepted Jesus Lord through even through those who are viewing or those who would view later. So uh, likewise, we will also be committed to bring people to Christ and, and, to, and to let them know that, that Christ can work a new thing in their life and they can be totally and completely changed, be new creations in Christ Jesus. So there are a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Destruction. When we say the word death in the Bible, we always see it, it, mean, it does not mean graveyard, dead, the person is. It simply means you're a defeated person. You're, at the end of your life is going to be a defeat anyway. Whatever way you think is right and you keep doing it in your own way, and the end thereof is a way of defeat. It's going to be all defeat because it's all my way of doing things. But if I put my focus on the Lord and say, God, help me, I need help. We need a lot of help from the Lord, right? You know, the song that we sang is an old song we used to sing in our church when we got first saved, leaning on Jesus. When I read that, when I sing that song, I remember, and this scripture that comes into my mind, in Proverbs chapter number three and verse five, Proverbs chapter number three and verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart not half of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Something to my mic. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Don't lean unto your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Make, make, your, make your effort to say, God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting in you. I believe in you. I'm believing in you. I can, I can do nothing by my own strength. I'm not going to lean on to myself. I'm going to lean on the arms of Jesus. I'm going to lean. I'm going to trust you with all my heart and soul and mind. I'm not, I've, I've walked my own way and I made a mess of my life, but I don't want to continue doing what I'm doing. And if you don't continue doing what you're doing, you're not going to have the same results. But if you continue doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to have the same results over and over again. It's a cycle. If you don't change your way of living, you will always know there's something far better that's going to happen to you. If I've been doing certain things in a certain way, and I have been having results, I'm not very happy with the results, I've got to repent and change. And say, Lord, I'm willing to go for a change. And I want to start with the Bible. This is the book that will enable me to change, that will help me to change my way of living. It's not going to be any other way. I'm going to go back to the scriptures and I'm going to meditate on the scriptures. I'm going to believe in the scriptures. I'm going to walk in the ways that I have never walked before. I'm going to do something different in my life. You know, when God spoke to Moses, go with me to the book of Joshua. God spoke to Moses. Moses was a very famous man, and he was the leader, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, bringing them into the promised land, but he couldn't enter into the promised land because of the pressure that people brought against him, and he disobeyed the Lord. And God said, Moses, you have disobeyed me before the people. I don't think you can lead them. And then he put Joshua in track and said, okay, you're going to lead them to the promised land. He brought them to the promised land. He opened up the, uh, destroyed the, the walls of Jericho and got the people into the promised land. And we need to understand that God has a purpose in bringing us into the promised land that we may enjoy the promised land. You have come into the promised land. And you've got to know what's promised for you. If you don't know what the promises are for you, you're just going to accept whatever comes your way. Right? So, Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 6. Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 6. Okay, we'll read from verse number 5. Verse number five, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Take it into your heart. There shall not be, there shall not be able, there shall not be any man who shall be able to stand before you. In other words, nobody can hinder you, your walk with the Lord. Anybody, you know, people always give an excuse. I, I would love to follow the Lord only if she was not in my way. Only he was not in my way. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. You see, we always love to give excuses. The easy way is say, I, I would follow the Lord wholly if not of her, if not of him, if not of this situation. But God says there's not going to be any man who will be able to stand before you all your life. No man is going to say, oh, hold it. You cannot be. You can't be doing all this. Who do you think you are? You can't be living a Christian life. You can't be living in this, in this sin sick world. You can't live a totally, completely healed life in this miserable world. You've got to be miserable. You've got to be defeated. We're all defeated. No, stop it. You cannot live this life. No man will be able to stand before thee in all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, Pharaoh couldn't stop Moses from bringing the children of Israel out of his hand. They were the strongest army. Egyptians were the strongest in this place. But Moses, nobody was able to stand before Moses. He stood before Pharaoh. He stood before the armies. And he commanded the Red Seas to open and he commanded the Red Seas to shut up, close up, and the enemies were all drowned. No man was able to stand before Moses. 
Because if God has commanded you something, nobody can stop you except for yourself. If he has said something to you, you better get his word and say, God, I know nobody can stop me. Nobody can stop me. No thing can stop me. No person can stop me from following him. Right? So shall I, so will I be with thee. And I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. God says, I'm going to be with you. Right? I'm going to be with you. And you will not fail. I will be with you. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? People can, can rise up against us. They can speak curseful words over us. They can hate us. They can try all they can, but it shall not be profitable for them. But God said, I'm standing with you. I'm standing for you. If you're willing to walk with me, I'm walking with you. We're going to go together. And I will handle your affairs. If you do what I tell you, so the only way you can walk with God is you have to walk humbly before your God. In the book of Micah, it says, in chapter 6 and verse number 7, we should read that. Come back to this Joshua again. Micah, the book of Micah. These scriptures are very important to me and I, I, I make them important when I preach also because when you go back home, you're going to refer to these scriptures and say, oh my God, I didn't know that this was in the Bible. Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8. Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8. He had showed thee, O man, what is good. He had showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee? What does the Lord require of you? To do justly. To do justly. Right? And... And the only thing that we need to understand through this scripture, the revelation of the scripture is, the just shall walk by faith. The just shall walk by faith. So if you're, if you're a just man, you're going to walk by faith. The only way you can walk with God is by faith. And to love mercy, be gracious, not trust in your good words, works. Be gracious, be kind-hearted. And to walk Humbly with your God. God walks with humble people. He doesn't walk with the proud. The Bible says the proud are far off from him. But the humble, he exalts them. Walk humbly with your God. The Bible says the proud are far off from him. God says, I have nothing to do with the proud person because he, he is to himself. He's drunk with pride. Have you met proud people? Oh, many of us all have met proud people. They're drunk. They're drunk. Their pride has deceived them. They're drunk in their own way of looking at things. And they kind of think just because you're a humble character that they can run over you and use you like a rug. But you're the winner. They are the losers. Because you're walking humbly with your God. God walks with the humble. He doesn't walk with the proud people. Proud, proud people are, are of no use at all for him because he, he can never walk with them, never talk to them. You can't talk to a proud person. They're always filled with their own backslidden ways. A backslider, the Bible says a backslider is always filled with his own words. A backslider is filled with his own words. Right? So you don't want to be somebody who is a, a backsliding person. That's a proud-hearted person. God is going to walk with you. I will be with thee and I will not fail thee. Going back to the book of Joshua again and chapter 1 and verse number 5. I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be with you. As I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. So if God is for us, nobody can stand against us. You stand your ground and you start saying, yes, Lord, I believe. I know there is nothing impossible with God. Verse number six, going back to Joshua 1 and verse number six. Be strong and good courage and of good courage. It's important for you to be strong. Be strong. That's your part. I'm not going to be a person who's going to be carried away, swayed away, 
people just say things today i believe something and tomorrow i believe something else i'm just carried away by all what i feel your feelings can take you all over but if you say i'm strong in faith i'm not going to be carried away by every wind of doctrine i'm not going to be carried away by what people say i'm going to be strong and of good courage not stubborn courage good courage there can be somebody who can be courageous but they can be stubborn they can be stubborn in their own way they can be so self-centered and they would think they are the only ones who are right good courage always he's somebody who is saying i am of good courage i i know my courage is of the lord i'm trusting in the lord it's not my i'm not trusting in my flesh i'm not trusting in my intelligence i'm trusting in the word of god i'm trusting in the word of god i'm trusting in the living word of god god means everything to me my decisions don't come by me it comes by god i don't choose to make my own decisions I let God lead me into making and one thing I'll tell you God will never push you into making any decisions He will never push you to make any decisions he will only lead you He's the good shepherd he walks before you and he leads you God leads you he's your shepherd and he leads you and my sheep hear my voice Jesus said My sheep hear my voice And God, God when God speaks to us you can know it's God. You can know it's God. Because when you're doing something I have may, I mean I have many times I wanted to do something and I was really eager in doing something and I said I'm going to do it anyhow. And then I hear a still small voice. No that's not very important. It may it may not be a sinful thing but that's not important for you now. And when I hear that word and God speaks to me and say no no you don't have to do that and I know that's not important so so my desire for doing that has gone away I don't want to do it it's not a sinful thing but still for all when God says no let it be no when God says no let it be no why would I want to do something that God doesn't want me to do that he is not pleased with be strong and of good courage For unto this people shall thou divide the inheritance of the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them and then in verse 7 it says only be thou strong and very courageous be strong and very courageous because you will always have an opportunity of changing your decisions you'll always be tempted to make the wrong move you'll always have opportunities there'll be plenty of opportunities you will have to drift away from the things of god and do something contrary to what he wants you to do that's the reason you got to be strong and very courageous you got to be strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to the law of, according to all the law according to the whole word of god which Moses my servant commanded thee or what have we commanded in the scriptures turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left hand don't turn from it to the right just keep your focus on the word so when i when we when we see this thing we kind of think oh is it it's too hard see your attention can be drawn to the right and to the left you can be you can be tempted to move And, and and not be strong enough to handle this but this word is good for you it's going to help you it's going to bring you into the place that you will say thank god i made this decision 5 years ago 5 days ago 5 weeks ago maybe and this has helped me if only I, i can i can really thank god for the decisions i made 25 30 years ago that i'm blessed today when i the, the greatest decision i made in my life was to receive jesus into my life that was 36 years ago in 83 and since then i have been thanking the lord but since then i'm a decision upon decision i got to make decisions see the the one decision that we make in receiving jesus lord of our life is to have a eternal soul and spirit to be 
uh, in heaven. We become citizens of heaven. We, we, we are born into the family of God. But every other decision is for us to enjoy the goodness of God in this green earth. Every decision that we make, every decision, every decision we make, maybe we have come late into knowing the Lord. Now, every one of us, we have, we haven't, we didn't get born into the family of God on the day, on day one that we were born into this world. Right? Every one of us, we were born at different times. We got, we got saved at different ages. We had, some of us, we carried a lot of baggage and we came. And we just laid it at the feet of Jesus and said, God, I don't know what to do with all this baggage that I'm having, but I'm receiving you as, but I, I still want to carry all this baggage and go. I got to say, I'm going to leave it at the cross. No more. I'm, not, I, I'm going to be free now. I'm just going to cast all my care over to the Lord. For the Lord cares for me. I'm going to cast all my care to the Lord. I, I don't want to carry any worry and care. I'm, I don't want to go with the baggage in my life. I've got to just lay it down and say, I'm finished with it. My life is changed. I'm a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new in my life. And every day is a day of decisions for us. We make good decisions, bad decisions. But once you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and you start meditating on the scriptures, reading the scriptures, particularly giving your heart and soul into the New Testament, read the New Testament. And also through the New Testament, you understand the Old Testament and you would find that the entire Bible is going to be so open to you and so clear to you. And you can see the way that people made decisions in their lives and the outcome and the results that they had. And you would take all of them as an example into your life and say, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't make that mistake. Many times I've had people who call me and they want me to make an important decision now and there's a lot of pressure put upon me. But I say, wait, give me some time. I know it's, it's a good work that you're calling me into and you want me to join your committee and do a very good work, but let me take my time. I don't want to be pressurized. You know, when you're pressurized, that ought to be the time you should never make a decision, an important major decision in life. That should never be the time that you make a decision because you're, you're doing it out of pressure. You should say, no, there's something wrong there. But God doesn't put all that pressure on you to make the decision now. Tomorrow is no more tomorrow. You're not going to have another tomorrow. God is a God of a second chance always. You can always say, well, I'll wait. I'll wait. God will give me exactly the directions. And when you go back home, God might even speak to you through a dream. Many times he has spoken to me through dreams, through visions, through impression dreams, through the word. And, and, and hardly, and most of the time, you may even hear his audible voice. You may hear him while I'm preaching today because you're here to hear what the Spirit says. If you, see to the book, if you go to the book of Revelation, the Spirit, hear what the Spirit says to the church. All the seven churches you see, hear what the Spirit says to the church. It's the Holy Spirit who is speaking to you right now. Maybe you have made a decision in your life and God may confirm that. Or God may want you to not do it now. Or God may want you to do it sometime later or whatever. So, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper whithersoever you go. You will prosper. You will do wisely. You will prosper. If you, if you meditate on the scriptures, if you, if you do what the scriptures say, the word prosper there also means that you will make wise decisions in life. You'll make wise decisions in life. You know, sometimes we think prosperity is like, uh, how do we say, it's just like a, a gamble. Maybe I just put something and I get it fast. But there may be some wise decisions that you might have to make in life to enjoy the prosperity of God. To truly enjoy all what God has for you, you have to make some wise decisions 
God will make, God will lead you to make wise decisions. He's not going to make decisions for you, but he's going to make you, he's going to, he's going to fill you with his knowledge and wisdom and understanding that you will make wise decisions. That you will not do the way that you were doing things in the past. Right? You're going to make some wise decisions. This book of the law, verse number 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. See, it's a command. It's not an option. These words that you are learning, that you have been made to understand while you read the scriptures and while you hear the sermons, let these words be in your mouth and let it not depart out of your mouth. Or don't just speak things out loosely. Let these words be glued to your tongue and you will only speak these words and nothing but this word. If you're talking about healing and if you have, if God has given you some insight on healing, that's wise understanding. That's making you wise concerning your body, your health. And whatever he says, do. Do whatever he says. And when you start doing it, keep it in your tongue and keep speaking it over and over again. Once you get a revelation of that you are born into the family of God, just like the song that we sang where Jesus died for us and he, uh, he took upon himself our sickness. He took upon himself our sickness. Get a revelation of that word. I say, God, your word said that by your stripes I am healed. So you're going to meditate on that scripture. You're going to get those scriptures out all on healing. And you're going to say, body from this day onwards. Now remember, your body is only going to obey your words. Right? It's very important. Your body must obey your words. Don't let your body control your life. People just say, I have... Well, I have no control. That's the biggest problem. No, God has given you a spirit of self-control. God has given you a spirit of self-control. Don't ever say, I have no control over my body. My body drags me into certain things. My body wants me to do things. My body wants me to drink and, and do all kinds. No, no, your body. Your, you need to control your own body. The body can be just a puppet. You got to, you, you, the real you is your spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. This is the place that you live in. The body is the place that you live in. So what controls your body is your tongue. Your tongue is like a rudder of a huge, gigantic ship. Whithersoever the captain decides that it should be turned, it's all decided by the rudder. It's all decided by the rudder. The ship doesn't go wherever it says, well, we just leave the sh- we'll just leave it alone. Even if it is computerized, it is computerized and it is fully directed by a rudder. Right? It doesn't do, because that'll be, that, you're going to have some things coming in your life and you will have to make certain decisions. You can, be, you, have, you can be thrown this way and that way, but you've got to come to the place where you say, I choose. It's a matter of choice. I choose. Right? Let the book of let the let the book, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Don't let it go out of your mouth. Keep it in your mouth. Confess it daily. Speak it out. Speak it out. Because words have life. Words have life. Words you speak, you might say, well, it doesn't matter what I say. Well, it does matter because the Bible said it's so. And people have experienced it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, the Bible says. You can speak death-filled words out of your mouth and experience death. I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm broke. I'm going from bad to worse. I don't think anything, working out, anything is working out. And all of a sudden, in a, in a little while, you have suicidal thoughts coming into your mind. Why? Because these words that you have let loose from your own mouth, you have permitted the spirit of suicide, which is the devil himself, 
he comes and he has a ruling authority over you. Now he's putting a lot of pressure on you. No point you living in this world. Nobody likes you after all. The only one that you loved has also forsaken you and, and, and run away from you. And why would you want to live now? It's better you die. Maybe you might have something better. That's how people commit suicide. These suicidal thoughts that come into your mind because of the words that you have uttered. You have let the enemy throw back at you. See, your words are like seeds that go out of your mouth and you get a harvest, either good or bad. That's the reason you've got to hold the word of God in your mouth and say, this word shall not depart out of my mouth. If I'm going to speak anything, I'm going to speak the oracles of God. If I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak only the promises of God. If I'm going to speak anything, I'll only speak what God has spoken to me. And if I want to do anything concerning my mouth, my words, I'm going to only speak the word. That's it. That's it. So this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Day and night. Day and night. Meditate on the scriptures. You know, we always have excuses and we always think, well, number one, I'm not a preacher. I don't have to meditate on the scriptures. Number two, what good is it going to do? If I'm going to meditate on the scriptures, well, there are so many other things that I can meditate on. The newspapers, all what the media says, all the rubbish that is in the world. There's a lot that we hear and we want to meditate on this, those things and we want detailed facts. How much, that's simply what it means. Meditation is to get into detailed facts of things. I want everything in detail. I want to know everything, so I wait the next day. What's coming out in the breaking news? What's coming out? And I want all the details. Now, what's, what good is it doing to you? Nothing. And all of a sudden, you, after a few days, it's all gone, it's all erased, and there is, no, there is nothing at all about what you've been hearing, and you really gave your heart and soul into it, and you said, I want to know everything about this. And, and finally, you find there's nothing... Nothing more that they talk about. But do you know something? Meditating on this word. I have meditated this word for the last 30 years or over. And I still find it is life-giving. It is, it is life-giving to me. It is life-giving to people. It, has, it is bringing results because these are words of God. These words that go out, they don't come back empty. They are there to fulfill a purpose. So why would I want to meditate on things that are of no profit compared to the things that, that can profit somebody? I'm going to meditate these scriptures for myself and also to give to others because this is, this is an eternal word. These words don't, are not temporary or it is not just for one generation. These words are for generations and generations and generations. Today when we look at the world, we would look at the world and say, well, things that are in the Bible are not how things are happening around. People are wicked. People are cruel. People are selfish. People do things. I mean, you're talking about a holy Bible. But look at the world out there. How wicked and unreasonable are they? Does that matter to God? It did matter to God. That's the reason he gave Jesus, his son, for people to get saved. Thousands of years ago when God saw wickedness just like this that we're experiencing today, he spoke to a man called Moses and Moses, I'm sorry, he found a man called Noah. And Noah found favor with God. He said, Noah, there's going to be rains, and they had never experienced rains at this time. He said, I want you to build an ark, a huge, gigantic ark, and go tell everybody that there's going to be rains. And all those who believe, they can come into the ark and stay there. People made a mockery of him. People said, we have never experienced rains. Who do you think you? He was despised. 
he was despised but noah his wife his three sons and his and their wives the eight of them they were the only ones who believed what noah said now did that matter to god god was grieved in his heart that all the others did not believe and they all perished when the rains came down they all perished there was nothing every mountain was covered with water but noah's ark was right on top and nothing happened one man believed he and his household they were saved and then when the water subsided we find that noah came back to the world again and people still are the same today back again god is trying to prove over and over again that judgment is coming we 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 think well it's all right i mean what is to happen will happen that is not the way it happened what is to happen will happen that's so true because that's the sovereignty of god but what have you what decision have you made concerning your life have you decided to walk with god or have you decided to stay where you are and say well what is to happen will happen i got to make my own decisions so meditate on the scriptures day and night day and night don't get into media day and night don't get into what people say because you want to live a life of freedom you want you don't want to be contaminated with the news of the world and you find it so difficult to read the bible and you find it so difficult to get a revelation you find it so difficult to share the gospel with somebody else because our when our minds are contaminated we find it difficult but if we purify our thoughts and say lord i'm going to meditate on the scripture day and night it didn't say it's a commitment it doesn't mean that you got to have a bible all the time wherever you go it simply means your mind is important your mind is important put thoughts into your mind that is concerned in the bible think on these things things that are of good report things that are lovely things that would bring peace and joy into your life so keep meditating on the scripture so if you got a revelation of healing stay healed believe that you can live healed talk about healing meditate find more scriptures on healing find people whom you can lay hands and pray on do something concerning healing and you'll find long years back when i was called to pray pray for somebody who was sick I'm, that was about 25 years ago and this guy was and then so i i went and i prayed for him and i said uh, uh, god has put healing in your hands you're going to get all of this and you're going to get healed and you're going to also start laying hands on people because god wants you to do something and every time i pray for people i always say your hands are anointed especially if they are christians your hands are anointed to lay hands on other people that they can be healed every believer has a right to lay hands on others and don't worry about what kind of a disease that they're going through and what kind you're afraid of contaminating diseases but jesus said lay hands that they may recover so get a revelation and start finding avenues where you can uh, develop your healing uh, the 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 way that you could make this revelation a reality in your life it's one thing to have a revelation it's another thing for it to come into reality a revelation turns out to be a reality being religious would never bring you a revelation but a revelation that you have that you put to work in your life would turn out to be a reality and you would see some people getting healed you would start seeing those headaches that you were getting and those pains that you were having in your body are no more because you're meditating on the scriptures just by meditating and singing and worshiping the lord you can see your body walking in health you may say i really thought that we got to do this that and the other and and well i know that there are disciplinary actions that we have to make we have we, we got to be we got to have some exercises that's why god the bible says uh, physical exercises profits you little or for a short time which means you you continue to do some physical exercises and then for a while it will help you but if you stop your exercises it's going to be back again but godliness 
profits you unto all things. I'm going to close with that scripture. I'm going to close with that scripture. Go with me to the book of uh, Second, First Timothy chapter 3, chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. And verse number 6 onwards. If thou put, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, right? Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up with words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane, refuse, there are things that we need to refuse and resist. Refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. I don't know what these old wives' fables are, but there are so many. If you do this, this will happen. If this happens, you better be careful. Uh, all kinds of things, you know, old wives' fables. There are lots of things people have got involved with. I'm afraid of doing this. I'm afraid of doing that. If I do this, this old wives' fable. But exercise rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little or it is for a short period. I know bodily exercise is good. It's nice to keep your body fit. But it profits you for a little time. Having promises of this, but then he said, but godliness is profitable unto all things. What is godliness? Believing what God says. That's what it, that's what it means. Godliness is just not trying to be religious in the presence of people. People think godliness is, oh, you just, you know, put this sour face on you and, you know, make people know that you're very religious now, after all. That's what people have thought about godliness. But there are godly people who are not religious, but they are spiritual. They believe God. They believe in his word. They believe in the promises of Jesus. Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness profiteth unto all things. I want to be profitable in every area of my life. So if you're a godly man, you will profit every, in every area of your life. Not a few things. Having promise of this life that now is, and also that which is to come. Right? Godliness is somebody who loves the Lord, who walks with his God humbly, who meditates on the scriptures, who glues the scriptures into his tongue and says, nothing else shall come out of my mouth except for the word of God. And who meditates on the scriptures and who, who, who says, I'm willing to follow you all. I'm not going to give any excuses because I know no man will be able to stand before me. No man is able to stand before me and be a, be my, be a hindrance to me. You know, people always, it's very easy for me to give. I wish I had started this early. I wish. But God can start something new in your life now. And he has. And he did. He says in his scriptures in the book of Philippians, chapter 1 and verse number 6. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, he that has begun a good work in you. Right? Being confident of this very thing, he that has begun a good work in you has started a good work in your life. You know, when I came to know the Lord, I, I thought, oh my God, why did I mess up with all this rubbish in my life? I should have known him better. But I thank God, 36 years ago, at least I knew him. At least now I'm far better than what I was. Being confident of this very, very thing, he which has begun a good work in you, he begins a good work in you and will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until you see him face to face, he's going to work at it. And he has begun a good work in your life and thank God for the good work and believe God that he's moving in your life and he's causing things to change in your life. But you've got to walk with him. You've got to believe in him. You've got to say, I'm going to agree with this word. I'm not going to despise this word. I may not be a theologian. That's not... That's not what God is important. I mean, there were Pharisees. They were theologians. They knew the Old Testament scriptures very well. But they never were able to walk the walk of Jesus. I mean, Jesus simply spoke. I only hear what I hear my father say and I do exactly what my father. These Pharisees with all that knowledge, they couldn't compete themselves with Jesus. Why? What are the difference? 
It's not that theological knowledge that you have. It is working knowledge by revelation that you receive through the scriptures. You can know something, but you are not in obedience to what you know. If they, if the Pharisees and the Sadducees were obedient to what they knew, they knew a lot. Because Jesus spoke Old Testament scriptures and told them. He, he reminded them, but they, they knew. That's why I like the scripture when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles except God be with them. We know, but we don't want to accept you. Accept, I mean, of course, Nicodemus accepted him. But he said, we know, we have been discussing about you. I mean, everything that Jesus did and spoke, they had a knowledge about but they never committed themselves to Jesus, except for Nicodemus or probably uh, some other Pharisees also. So you just have to be a hearer and a doer of God's word. Right? You got to be a hearer and a doer of God's word. You got to say, God, I'm, I, I know nothing but one thing that I know. If I can hear what you say, I'm going to do exactly what you want me to do. You've got to just come to God and say, I'm a child of God. I don't want to stay a novice, but I want to grow in the Lord. I want to, I want to grow and mature. You know, the Bible says knowledge alone puffs up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1 says, knowledge puffs you up, but love builds you. Knowledge puffs you up. People can be so puffed up with the knowledge that they have. Oh, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I can just tell you without reading the scripture what it, what it says, but that doesn't matter. Right? That doesn't matter. That doesn't help. That's not the scripture. Is I say that? 8-1. Eight, 8-1. One, eight, one. I'll say 1-8. One, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1. Not 1-8. Not touching things offered unto idols, we know... They are all, uh, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge can make you a proud hearted person. But love, that word charity means love. Who is love? God. God edifies. God brings things to pass. He builds you. God builds your life. Knowledge alone does not work things. But God, having, it's one thing to know God to come into a relationship with him and the second thing is to have fellowship with him. That will cause you to be edified. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that your words of life that you have ministered to us today will never return unto you void but it shall accomplish the purpose for which it is sent for. These are grounds, Lord, that you have sown your seed you have sent forth your seeds, the word of God, into their hearts, and it shall grow, and it shall bring forth fruit in the days to come, in the years to come, in the times to, that we are about to see. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that your word will not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which it is sent for, and it shall prosper in the thing for which you have sent. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for these words that have edified us, strengthened us, built and is continually building a character of God in us. I thank you for your people here, Lord. Bless and honor them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.